Financial Argument. Follow us on YouTube. I am Kenneth Amaduri, and we are witnessing violent moves in the market, and most notably triggered by this last week's event, Brexit, uh, especially since the markets were pricing in a stay vote. A surprise market triggered collapsing equities and soaring metals this week. And to discuss with me the markets today is Trader Steph. She's a returning guest and uh, she does fusion analysis of the markets and uses technicals to draw conclusions and she knows her stuff I can tell you she knows her stuff she's got a 14 year career with the New York City investment banking industry and you can follow her on Twitter at Trader Steph Trader Steph thanks for joining me today hey good morning thank you for having me back as always Absolutely. Well, I've been wanting to have you back, and we finally got a chance to connect. Steph, on Friday, we saw $2.1 trillion in stock values lost globally. One of the things you said in our last interview was that there will be a black swan event that moves precious metals, and Brexit did that. Let's get your initial thoughts here on Brexit. Yeah, that was a surprise on so many levels, I think, in my, my opinion, because most folks were looking for a remain. But as events began to unfold through the first half of the year, obviously the voters decided to let's leave. Right. So it was a pretty amazing event which took place in the markets. And no one was really sure which way it was going to tip until just a few days before. I mean, even at that point, Jim Rickards uh, had brought up that the bookies were betting big time, you know, odds leaning to their end for a uh, remain vote. And that completely got turned upside down. I mean, it was a 52 to 48 vote, but it doesn't matter. It was the majority, and they left. And that really just created chaos in the markets. I mean, some of the headlines, you know, quote, worse than Lehman, European bank bloodbath sparks dollar funding crisis, Greenspan on CNBC, quote, the worst period I recall since I've been in public office, unquote. Uh, mm -hmm. Trump, uh, they took their country back. We will take America back. Mm -hmm. um, central bankers around the world scramble to defend markets. Central bankers want to provide liquidity which is going to be the issue with the central banks, mm. right? I mean, are they going to drop money? Is it going to be QE? You know, I really don't think they know what they're going to do, but they have some ideas. But the bottom line is they have to provide liquidity to keep the market stable. Mm. Steph, uh, on Thursday, I actually bought gold. I, I, you know, I saw it down in at around 1260 and that's when I called my broker I I didn't know if it was gonna go lower at that point I just knew it pulled back and I wanted more of it and what he told me was that people are on the sidelines waiting to flood into the physical market whether it goes lower to buy more on the dip or as a fear trade you know in response to what will be the vote during the brexit uh, referendum vote here what I want to ask you is what what are you seeing with gold you've given us a lot of amazing insight in our prior interviews and uh, you know we're hitting some really really key technical levels here and you know I, I want to reiterate I mean you know you pointed out that 1250 was a significant point that we would cross and and we're now over 1300 uh, making brand new 52 week highs confirming gold's trajectory in bullish territory so kind of lay the groundwork here for what we can expect to see or, or what we are seeing in gold I want to bring up the uh, commitment of traders report first uh, it's not something I, I base my decisions on, decisions on solely but it is an important part of the mix. You know, there's always a confluence of variables and events that you need to pay attention to. And back in early March, uh, I put out a note because there was a lot of crazy things going on in the Commitment of Traders reports. And it was the same as always. The only difference was the extremes that we began to see. 
And you could actually see that playing out in the chart. And the big question was on everybody's mind, you know, when do you want to get in? With the money sitting on the sidelines, and what do you look at to make those decisions? And the COTs began to bleed into the conversation on Twitter and articles out there in the community. And I said, look, the commercials, otherwise known as the bullion banks, are always on the other side of the trade. If the price is going up, they're layering shorts. If the price is going down, they're layering longs. 99% of the time, they're right. But there's always a 1% of the time that they get stuck, just like the fake stuck. You know, they might get backed into a corner, no matter what those COTs are telling you. And what is doing that are the fundamentals in the market. Mm. You know, the, no matter what happens, there's chaos out there. And when you got chaos, it's really hard to give dates, predictions, and times. Steph, can we call this a a rip your panties off moment absolutely <laughs> so, let's take a look at the the gold daily chart and see what happened here pretty amazing stuff and once again it's exactly what happened the last time we did an interview where the move occurred at least if you live on the east coast the united states it occurred overnight and then when we opened we went down and we chopped sideways so if you weren't positioned before the move, you were out of luck. You ended up either panicking and buying something at a higher price or just don't do anything at all hoping for the next pullback. And I can't believe that since January I'm still hearing those comments out there in gold silverland. It's like, just get it already and get it over with mm. and sit tight. And, and watch the bull run. There's going to be volatility. You just need to be careful. So with that in mind, looking at this daily chart, we had the initial move up from January, and the gold chart flagged out. You got a beautiful flagpole, got a pin, and then, you know, chart patterns tend to evolve over time. You get a lot of different smaller patterns as it builds into something bigger and a bigger picture. And this time it built out into a megaphone pattern. And it was just classic. You need to have, on any chart pattern, you need to have two taps, either on the top or the bottom. And it did it. It was classic. Uh, you can't ask for any better when you get this. But the telltale was, what was it going to do after it hit the top channel line again one more time? Was it going to retest the bottom, which would have been a little bit of a bigger pullback, which folks wanting to jump in may be waiting for that? Or was it going to do the classic bullish bounce after a small decline? And Brexit gave that to us. Mm. Now, everything was pointing to what was going to happen. And on the DMI and the ADX, you look down there on the lower part of the chart, we got the alligator tongue. I mean, you really couldn't ask for more. The volumes were solid and moving forward. There were no extremes in volumes going up or down in opposite directions of price. You really couldn't ask for anything more to just get right and sit tight. And on this chart, I provide some Fibonacci extensions for folks if they want to make notes. If this move continues and we take out the high of what we put in this week, those are the near-term numbers that you need to look at. And uh, if we go to the weekly chart, I can show you something else. So the weekly chart, what we got here is the bigger picture. And we don't need to go all the way back to 1999 to figure this out. Let's just go back to the big fall in 2013 and what happened after that. When we had done the initial interviews back in the fall, there were some trend lines above that we needed to keep an eye on, and that was a trend line coming from the first 2013 high as well as the 2011 high. And you can see those two overhead trend lines. They're, they're the dotted lines coming down on an angle. And uh, most recently, we had taken out the bottom 2013 trend line, which was important. And we didn't want to have, we didn't want to violate that again after we had done the golden cross on the daily of the 50 over the 200. And then once again, there's that megaphone pattern. You can see that very clearly. But one other interesting aspect was that over a very long period of time from uh, around just after mid-2014, that is where we got a left shoulder on an inverse head and shoulders. Now, back then, you wouldn't know that would happen 
But once again, chart patterns play themselves out. You get specific patterns as it builds up to a bigger picture. And that's what happened here. So we got the inverse head and shoulders, and we have a neckline, which is where that blue line is. Mm. BMI X alligator tongue setup. Look at the volume flow from the initial bounce, or actually the pivot from the low put in January. The volume was just huge. It was rising. So on every move since January, we've had rising volumes on a rising price and falling volumes on a falling price which is technically very bullish for the upside. And lastly on this chart, there are some dotted horizontal lines. And I've got those broken down into Fibonacci's that are drawn from 1999 up to 2011 and 2013. And you can see where that resistance and support is. And I've also threw in some Fibonacci extensions, once again, for folks that are looking for some numbers to look forward to in the future. So... Um, bottom line, we're still bullish. Steph, I, let's talk about silver. One of the key points that you had mentioned in our previous interviews was the 2149 level for silver. And this week, we actually saw gold act as the fear trade in regards to Brexit. And silver, sure enough, lagged uh, gold in this week's uh, trade. And I, I want to get your thoughts here on silver and you know, one thing I did want to point out is that in the beginning of the year, gold was the first to move big. You know, we had all the craziness that had gone on, you know, at the start of the year, and gold was what moved first, and then it was silver that followed at a later point. So uh, I want to get your thoughts here on silver and what we're seeing in the technicals. Yeah, gold's actually been pulling silver along, but if you start digging deep down into the shorter time frames, kind of a mixed bag, uh, but overall when you average it out, it, it's gold that has really been pulling silver along. No real tight correlation per se, but uh, in the end, you know, little brother there always tends to do the catch up if it's not there already. And the percentage gains are going to be larger, you know, just the, for the sake of the way silver works and, and the price points. Mm -hmm. um, if we look at that silver weekly chart, yeah, the 2149 is a Fibonacci level, and you can see that on the chart. And the 2134 was the high we had in March back in 2008. And once we took out that level, you know, that was the rocket shot. So that's the number that I'm really focused on um, for a big move. Now, granted, there's, going, there's not absolutely nothing between there and the high. But the resistance is not going to be as difficult as what we've went through since mid-2013 on the initial breakdown because we need to work through all that stuff from the breakdown in 2013 to get back to the big momentum move. And just like on gold on the weekly, um, we've got an inverse head and shoulders here on the silver chart. But this one hasn't really broken out its neckline as decisively as gold did. Now, gold did uh, pull back from the high that it put in, but it broke that neckline by a much larger degree than silver has. Silver just kind of peeked its head out, and now it's waiting. And we, we talked about that number that's in that area. It's 1774, which was on the charts in the last interview. But the inverse head and shoulders hadn't played itself out yet. We didn't even talk about it. And what did we close at on Friday at the end of the week? 1772. Mm. So that's a number, and we got some resistance to get through until we get to that 2134, 2149 area. But, you know, the setup is beautiful if you look at it. We got the alligator tongue on the ADX. We got a rising volume pattern. Now, given there's a little drop-off on the volume in the last couple of weeks, but it's not significant in uh, relative to what the volumes used to be. You know, you really have to put in pers perspective. Mm. Well, and, you know, we can also look as silver as, hey, it's not gold in that sense, where gold was the fear trade. And, you know, silver, people might get a little hesitant with it as it does have some industrial uses, you know, in an event where, you know, they're worried about the economy. 
Sure, because, uh, you know, I don't know what the exact number is. Uh, uh, below 50 or above 50 sometimes it fluctuates. What percentage is industrial demand? So it's got that other dynamic that affects it, its price. Mm -hmm. Steph, let's get into the silver daily chart. I have this here in front of me, and uh, I know you, uh, you, you had some insight that you wanted to share regarding it. Yeah, on the silver, that, that blue horizontal line, that's the neckline, you know, going back for the inverse head and shoulders. But it shows where the golden cross was on the daily, the 50 over the 200. I've also included um, some Fibonacci extensions uh, for some folks that may want numbers before we hit that 21 and a half area. But, you know, also note in that right shoulder, it's got its own little inverse head and shoulders in it. So there are just so many bullish patterns in these charts. It's not funny. I've never seen so many in such a short period of time, at least in the time that I've been doing charts and following the gold and silver markets. And once again, on the daily, we got the ADX set up, and the volumes are just solid. There's nothing to complain about on these charts to say they're bearish. They're definitely bullish, except for profit-taking events. Staff, I've been following the miners here in 2016 and we know that the miners have been the place to be when it comes to leveraging the moves that we've seen with the underlying metals so I want to get your analysis on what your thoughts are regarding the miners sure I sent you a list of um, my own personal little list of some miners that I'm watching and um, there it is everybody can jot them down and use them and with that in mind, let's take a look at the GDX, the weekly. And that's the big boys, not the juniors, but the big boys. And we did this chart uh, on our last interview. And where we were sitting, we were right around that lateral um, around January 2015, and we bumped into some resistance. And all the targets that we talked about, you know, that resistance and the 150 exponential moving average overhead that was taken out too when we moved on to the next level so the 2558 which was the 200 EMA at that time and the Fibonacci 23.6 has been met and we've taken them out and also mentioned in the last interview if we were able to get through these numbers and get up through the 200 the next number we would be looking at would be the 38.2 for 33 bucks and some change, and that's where we're at. When you drill down through the chart, look, look at that alligator tongue with the ADX. Mm. It's just really pretty. And the volume flows have steadily increased and have remained. No severe fluctuations in one direction or the other. And those two dotted lines coming down from the top left, those are trend lines. The one that goes off to where you can't see it goes all the way back to the high put in back in 2011 for 6698 and <laughs> we're sitting at, what do we close at, um, 2671? Mm. We got a ways to go. <laughs> so, Staff, as you've said in prior interviews, we know that the Fed is one and done, and we saw that. We saw that happen here as the, in June when they backed off of rising the interest rates. And, you know, I want to ask you, what do you believe central bank response will be to the panic that we are seeing this week, or will it just be more of the same? I'm afraid to make a prediction. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's just nuts. You, you, you can take a good guess, and there are multiple possibilities with every guess, given the circumstances. Um, but they're definitely stuck. But just like the commercials got you know, painted into a corner, but they still keep adding on the shorts. I mean, we're looking like like the most beautiful short squeeze we've probably ever seen. Who knows when it's going to happen? But back to the Fed, yeah. So they backed out in June. I mean, you look at the data and you look at the fundamentals of the economy, just that they wouldn't have raised rates. But then, as we talked about with Brexit, things started to get a little weird. They started getting a little worried. Some of the polls started to come in. And they cited that as well as other pressures in the world may affect, and they just wanted to sit tight and not do anything. And, you know, part of that decline we had in the gold price uh, in, the, in the megaphone pattern, you know, the, the bank governors were out there gel boning as usual, which wasn't helpful. Oh, we're going to raise rates. We're going to raise rates. Forget about it. 
how many years have we been dealing with this? They're not going to do it, not to mention if we throw 1% total of interest rate rise, the, the um, interest on the debt, we, we just cannot service the debt anymore where it is. So there's got to be some big change. And while that's happening, I mean, what are the headlines? Loss of confidence, Fed credibility collapsing, no more rate cuts, you know, until a year or two uh, out. Look, there, there is no taper caper. The balance sheet is remaining steady. They're reinvesting the proceeds of the money that they did print as we go along. They flattened the yield curve. Interest rates are still falling on the yields for treasuries since their rise in late December. And negative interest rate policy, you know, Japan just really set it off. That's what got gold and silver moving. I mean, there was already in Europe. But then Japan was the second Western, you know, quote unquote Western uh, bloc that didn't nerf. And there's only one left, and that's the United States. What's Yellen going to do? What's the Fed going to do? They're going to do nothing. Mm. We got Brexit. We got the summer pattern coming up. We got the election coming up. The data is really bad across the board on the economy. Are they going to print funny money out of helicopters and drop it? No, I think they're going to focus more on liquidity because that's been the key phrase since Brexit. Mm. Whether it be Bank of England, Bank of Japan, they want to provide liquidity. They're not really talking funny money, which was struck down. Was it Sweden or Switzerland where they had that referendum or that decision needed to be made and was decided not to do it? You know, like QE for the people, permanent checks every month for the rest of your life. Who was that? Steph, uh, I, I got to ask you, uh, when it comes to what we saw here with Brexit, and this is speculation, a lot of people are talking about it and wondering, is it possible that the, the powers that be let this happen and, uh, you know, the collapse might be closer than we think and the, the result will just be to blame what had happened on the anti-establishment, on the fact that, you know, Britain did leave and they'll have a scapegoat for the reasons why we are dealing with this collapse scenario. All conspiracy theories aside, they can't control what the individual, what the public is going to vote. You know, the vote was so close to begin with. It barely won, but it won, and that's what matters. But it's definitely a vote against the globalist agenda, because look, their plan was to create a North American Union with one currency, uh, the European Union with one currency, an Asian bloc with one currency, and an African bloc with one currency. And then they could take all those areas and create the global government with the UN and have one currency overall. Of course, that's going to take a long time. But if you look at Brexit, no, I don't think the elites are... Uh, you know, I don't have it, you know how to describe it. I mean, it looks like a controlled demolition in many respects, and maybe that's just because they've been propping up the markets for so long. Mm. It's just train wreck waiting to happen, but it's a slow one. And they, they can't control all the variables. But I think more people are catching the wind, you know, getting seeing some of the facts versus what the crap you're hearing in mainstream media. Yep. Steph, I couldn't agree with you more. Everyone, this is Trader Steph, and you can follow her at Twitter, uh, at Trader Steph. Trader Steph, any last words that you'd like to share with everyone before we said goodbye here? And, and again, thank you so much for coming on the show and bringing to our audience this amazing insight and uh, just continuing to update us on what is going on with precious metals and geopolitical and economic events. Hey, thanks for having me again. Um, always a pleasure. Love doing these interviews. Uh, I'll say the same thing I said in the in past interviews at the end. You know, you want to protect your wealth. That's what it's about. Um, and it's preferable to have it in your hand. And if you're playing in the markets, you know, this is in 401k automatic deductible. You throw it into your account. No, this is something you need to you need to pay attention to these markets right now because not only is it volatile, but we're in a very important time with where there's so much going on. 
where you need to take advantage of that. So be careful out there. Steph, thanks so much for coming on the show with me today. Really appreciate it. Financial argument. Follow us on YouTube. I am Kenneth Amaduri, and we are witnessing violent moves in the market, and most notably triggered by this last week's event, Brexit, uh, especially since the markets were pricing in a stay vote. A surprise market triggered collapsing equities and soaring metals this week. And to discuss with me the markets today is Trader Steph. She's a returning guest. And uh, she does fusion analysis of the markets and uses technicals to draw conclusions. And she knows her stuff. I can tell you she knows her stuff. She's got a 14-year career with the New York City investment banking industry. And you can follow her on Twitter, at Trader Steph. Trader Steph, thanks for joining me today. Hey, good morning. Thank you for having me back, as always. Absolutely. Well, I've been wanting to have you back, and we finally got a chance to connect. Steph, on Friday, we saw $2.1 trillion in stock values lost globally. One of the things you said in our last interview was that there will be a black swan event that moves precious metals, and Brexit did that. Let's get your initial thoughts here on Brexit. Yeah, that was a surprise on so many levels, I think, in my, my opinion, because most folks were looking for a remain. But as events began to unfold through the first half of the year, obviously the voters decided to let's leave. Right. So it was a pretty amazing event which took place in the markets. And no one was really sure which way it was going to tip until just a few days before. I mean, even at that point, Jim Rickards uh, had brought up that the bookies were betting big time, you know, odds leaning to their end for a uh, remain vote. And that completely got turned upside down. I mean, it was a 52 to 48 vote, but it doesn't matter. It was the majority, and they left. And that really just created chaos in the markets. I mean, some of the headlines, you know, quote, worse than Lehman, European bank bloodbath sparks dollar funding crisis, Greenspan on CNBC, quote, the worst period I recall since I've been in public office, unquote. Uh, mm. Trump, uh, they took their country. Out that 1250 was a significant point that we would cross, and, and we're now over 1,300, uh, making brand new 52-week highs, confirming gold's trajectory in bullish territory. So kind of lay the groundwork here for what we can expect to see or, or what we are seeing in gold. I want to bring up the uh, commitment of traders report first. Uh, it's not something I, I base my decisions on, decisions on solely, but it is an important part of the mix. You know, there's always a confluence of variables and events that you need to pay attention to. And back in early March, uh, I put out a note because there was a lot of crazy things going on in the commitment of traders reports. And it was the same as always. The only difference was the extremes that we began to see. And you could actually see that playing out in the charts. And the big question was on everybody's mind, you know, when do you want to get in? Well, the money sitting on the sidelines, and what do you look at to make those decisions? And the COTs began to bleed into the conversation on Twitter and articles out there in the community. And I said, look, the commercials, otherwise known as the bullion banks, are always on the other side of the trade. Back. We will take America back. Mm. Um, central bankers around the world scramble to defend markets. Central bankers want to provide liquidity, which is going to be the issue with the central banks, mm. right? I mean, are they going to drop money? Is it going to be QE? You know, I really don't think they know what they're going to do, but they have some ideas. But the bottom line is they have to provide liquidity to keep the market stable. Mm. Steph, uh, on Thursday, I actually bought gold. I, I, you know, I saw it down in 
at around 1260 and that's when I called my broker. I, I didn't know if it was gonna go lower at that point. I just knew it pulled back and I wanted more of it. And what he told me was that people are on the sidelines waiting to flood into the physical market whether it goes lower to buy more on the dip or as a fear trade you know in response to what will be the vote during the brexit uh, referendum vote here what i want to ask you is what what are you seeing with gold you've given us a lot of amazing insight in our prior interviews and uh, you know we're hitting some really really key technical levels here and you know i i want to reiterate i mean you know you pointed if the price is going up they're layering shorts if the price is going down they're layering long 99 percent of the time they're right but there's always a one percent of the time that they get stuck just like the fake stuff, you know, they might get backed into a corner. No matter what those COTs are telling you, and what's doing that are the fundamentals in the market. Mm. You know, the, no matter what happens, there's chaos out there. And when you got chaos, it's really hard to give dates, predictions, and times. Steph, can we call this a, a rip your panties off moment? Absolutely. <laughs> so, let's take a look at the, the gold daily chart and see what happened here pretty amazing stuff and once again it's exactly what happened the last time we did an interview where the move occurred at least if you live on the east coast the united states it occurred overnight and then when we opened we went down and we chopped sideways so if you weren't positioned before the move you were out of luck you ended up either panicking and buying something at a higher price or just don't do anything at all hoping for the next pullback. And I can't believe that since January I'm still here and the gold chart flagged out. You got a beautiful flagpole, got a pennant, and then, you know, chart patterns tend to evolve over time. You get a lot of different smaller patterns as it builds into something bigger and a bigger picture. And this time it built out into a megaphone pattern. And it was just classic. You need to have, on any chart pattern, you need to have two taps, either on the top or the bottom. And it did it. It was classic. Uh, you can't ask for any better when you get this. But the telltale was what was it going to do after it hit the top channel line again one more time? Was it going to retest the bottom, which would have been a little bit of a bigger pullback, which folks wanting to jump in may be waiting for that? Or was it going to do the classic bullish bounce after a small decline? And Brexit gave that to us. Mm. Now, everything was pointing to what was going to happen. And on the DMI and the ADX, you look down there on the lower part of the chart, we got the alligator tongue. I mean, you really couldn't ask for more. The volumes were solid and moving forward. There were no extremes in volumes going up or down in opposite directions of price. You really couldn't ask for anything more to just get right and sit tight. And on this chart, I provide some Fibonacci extensions for folks if they want to make notes. If this move continues and we take out the high of what we put in this week, those are the near-term numbers that you need to look at. And uh, if we go to the weekly chart, I can show you something else. So the weekly chart, what we got here is the bigger picture known as the bullion banks, are always on the other side of the trade. If the price is going up, they're layering shorts. If the price is going down, they're layering longs. 99% of the time, they're right. But there's always a 1% of the time that they get stuck, just like the big stuck. You know, they might get backed into a corner. No matter what those COTs are telling you, and what's doing that are the fundamentals in the market. Mm. You know, the... No matter what happens, there's chaos out there. And when you got chaos, it's really hard to give dates, predictions, and times. Steph, can we call this a, a rip your panties off moment? Absolutely. <laughs> so, let's take a look at the, the gold daily chart and see what happened here. Pretty amazing stuff. And once again, it's exactly what happened the last time we did an interview where the move occurred, at least if you live on the East Coast, the United States, it occurred overnight. And then when we opened, 
we went down and we chopped sideways. So if you weren't positioned before the move, you were out of luck. You ended up either panicking and buying something at a higher price or just don't do anything at all hoping for the next pullback. And I can't believe that since January I'm still hearing those comments out there in gold silver land. It's like, just get it already and get it over with mm. and sit tight and, and watch the bull run. If there's going to be volatility. You just need to be careful. So with that in mind, looking at this daily chart, we had the initial move up from January. Financial arguments. Follow us on YouTube. I am Kenneth Amaduri, and we are witnessing violent moves in the market, and most notably triggered by this last week's event, Brexit, uh, especially since the markets were pricing in a stay vote. A surprise market triggered collapsing equities and soaring metals this week. And to discuss with me the markets today is Trader Steph. She's a returning guest and uh, she does fusion analysis of the markets and uses technicals to draw conclusions and she knows her stuff I can tell you she knows her stuff she's got a 14 year career with the New York City investment banking industry and you can follow her on Twitter at Trader Steph Trader Steph thanks for joining me today hey good morning thank you for having me back as always Absolutely. Well, I've been wanting to have you back, and we finally got a chance to connect. Steph, on Friday, we saw $2.1 trillion in stock values lost globally. One of the things you said in our last interview was that there will be a black swan event that moves precious metals, and Brexit did that. Let's get your initial thoughts here on Brexit. Yeah, that was a surprise on so many levels, I think, in my, my opinion, because most folks were looking for a remain. But as events began to unfold through the first half of the year, obviously the voters decided to... Market, whether it goes lower to buy more on the dip or as a fear trade, you know, in response to what will be the vote during the Brexit uh, referendum vote here. What I want to ask you is, what, what are you seeing with gold? You've given us a lot of amazing insight in our prior interviews, and uh, you know we're hitting some really, really key technical levels here. And you know I, I want to reiterate, I mean, you, know, you pointed out that 1250 was a significant point that we would cross, and, and we're now over 1300, uh, making brand new 52-week highs, confirming gold's trajectory in bullish territory. So kind of lay the groundwork here for what we can expect to see or, or what we are seeing in gold. I want to bring up the uh, Commitment of Traders report first. Uh, it's not something I, I base my decisions on, decisions on solely, but it is an important part of the mix. You know, there's always a confluence of variables and events that you need to pay attention to. And back in early March, uh, I put out a note because there was a lot of crazy things going on in the Commitment of Traders reports. And it was the same as always. The only difference was the extremes that we began to see. And you could actually see that playing out in the chart. And the big question was on everybody's mind, you know, when do you want to get in? With the money sitting on the sidelines, and what do you look at to make those decisions? And the COTs began to bleed into the conversation on Twitter and articles out there in the community. And I said, look, the commercials, otherwise, let's leave. Right. So it was a pretty amazing event which took place in the markets. And no one was really sure which way it was going to tip until just a few days before. I mean, even at that point, Jim Rickards uh, had brought up that the bookies were betting big time, you know, odds leaning to their end for a uh, remain vote. And that completely got turned upside down. I mean, it was a 52 to 48 vote, but it doesn't matter. It was the majority, and they left. And that really just created chaos in the markets. I mean, some of the headlines, you know, quote, worse than Lehman, 
European bank bloodbath sparks dollar funding crisis. Greenspan on CNBC, quote, the worst period I recall since I've been in public office, unquote. Uh, mm. Trump, uh, they took their country back. We will take America back. Mm. Um, central bankers around the world scramble to defend markets. Central bankers want to provide liquidity, which is going to be the issue with the central banks, mm. right? I mean, are they going to drop money? Is it going to be QE? You know, I really don't think they know what they're going to do, but they have some ideas. But the bottom line is they have to provide liquidity to keep the market stable. Mm. Steph, uh, on Thursday, I actually bought gold. I, I, you know, I saw it down in at around 1260, and that's when I called my broker. I, I didn't know if it was going to go lower at that point. I just knew it pulled back, and I wanted more of it. And what he told me was that people are on the sidelines waiting to flood into the physical 